Welcome to part two of Holiday Myths, where we are just kind of talking about some common holiday myths regarding food, nutrition, health. The previous video, part one, I will have linked down below, so check that out if you haven't already. Today, we're gonna continue that conversation and talk about a few more myths. My goal is not just to debunk these, but really to empower people, empower with the tools, the knowledge, the information, to not get swept up by nutrition-related myths. Because you deserve to have a more enjoyable holiday season, one that doesn't require you to follow this kind of unnecessary rules or unnecessary recommendations. So if all that sounds good to you, let's go. Hi folks, welcome to our channel or welcome back. My name is Kat, I'm a licensed registered dietitian nutritionist and on this channel I like to talk about weight inclusive and weight neutral focused approaches to health as well as diving into scammy, in my opinion, unethical nutrition related businesses, products, mostly nutrition related MLMs and other fear mongering nutrition related claims. Let's go ahead and dive into a few more holiday related myths. Really, these can be taken into consideration or these also apply throughout the rest of the year. Diet culture does not take a break, but I typically see it a lot around the holidays as well. So the first myth is that eating certain foods will boost your metabolism and therefore have an impact on your body composition or to burn fat. Now you might see this regarding specific foods or specific like food supplements. Something that comes to mind is like a green tea kind of supplement and also like chili peppers or certain spices you can use in your food or with your food. But how true are those claims? Let's talk about it. So some foods do seem to have a small thermogenic kind of effect in our body. That's just like a fancy word, a way of saying that it can increase your metabolism a little bit, which would then increase your calorie burning rate. However, it's pretty small, it's pretty insignificant. There is not a specific food or a specific supplement that can have that kind of impact, significant impact on our metabolism. And also, in more of an opinion, it does not do anything to help support a healthy relationship with food. In fact, it kind of does the opposite. It's putting an emphasis on chasing like these fat burning foods or these fat burning supplements instead of spending time and focusing on one's relationship with food and just being able to approach food in a way that is nourishing and beneficial to their physical health, but also not harmful to those other aspects of health, like mental, social, and emotional well-being. It doesn't teach the skills or it doesn't really fit within the approach of food with curiosity, compassion, and context, which is what we really like to encourage on this channel. In fact, it's very much seeped into the diet culture that so often pushes people into diet cycling and weight cycling and into more stress on their body and a poorer relationship with food. Those kind of fat burning supplements, while they can have individual ingredients that have a slight lift or a slight increase in metabolism, again, it doesn't last long, it's not significant, and there could be other kind of contaminants in those supplements or interactions with specific medications that are being taken or even just health status overall. If someone has blood sugar related concerns or blood pressure related concerns or other concerns as well, it's just not something that you would find most registered dietitians, I can't think of any registered dietitians who would push a kind of fat burning supplement. It is just not something that you're going to see a reputable healthcare provider recommending because it is not anything that's gonna be significant and it can do more damage than good. We see these kind of supplements a lot in nutrition related MLM companies. So many of them have their own versions where you'll see a kind of blend that might be similar but with little differences here and there of the ingredient label and especially with the cost of those, it's just not something that I would recommend. Instead, I would encourage people to focus instead on what they can add into their intake that's gonna help provide them with nourishment, see how we can get more vegetables in their intake, more fruits, more water, see if we can make some changes to improve their sleep, consistency in movement, and just various things that are so much more evidence-based than a fat-burning supplement that's going to boost your metabolism. If somebody is going on this kind of like detox where they're drinking this beverage that has like spices in there and green tea, like chili peppers in there to help boost their metabolism, they're probably going to see some weight change, but it's not going to be because of those things. It's going to be because they're just trying to survive off of that kind of supplement or that kind of drink, those detox kind of programs. 
Also, Loki says hi. He says, no metabolism boosting supplements. I see a lot of promotion of these kind of detoxes and like metabolism boosting foods and supplements, especially around this year with the like talk about how holiday eating is and how this is a great way to kind of counteract that. And that is just not something that I would recommend, especially for someone who is wanting to move away from toxic dieting behaviors, move away from diet cycling, yo-yo dieting, and really move into a healthy relationship with food. It's just not something that I really see as like being paired together. The next myth is that emotional eating is bad or that emotional eating is something that you shouldn't do or just overall the context that emotional eating is a problem. Now, emotional eating is something that is often portrayed as something that is inherently negative. And during the holidays when emotions can be kind of all over the place, emotions can run high, food oftentimes is abundant for many people. Just working with people one-on-one, -on -one, I've often seen emotional eating like increase around this time of year or it happen a lot, quite a bit. But is emotional eating always a bad thing? Let's challenge that a little bit and look at it a little bit closer. So emotional eating is typically seen as a bad thing because it is seen as something that is like a lack of self-control or like an inherently unhealthy coping mechanism. However, it is important to note and remember that eating itself can be an emotional experience. It doesn't have to be negatively emotionally tied. It can also be positive. You can have joy around food, celebration around food, and it's a little bit too dichotomous for me a little too like all or nothing to just see emotional eating as bad also remember that food is not just fuel it is our culture memories experiences joy connection and eating in response to emotions is a very human behavior and is not inherently a bad thing when we turn to food in response from emotions in a way that's like a signal to our bodies that there might be something going on like in our mind something that our bodies or our mind is trying to tell us maybe we have emotions that aren't uncovered yet maybe they're a little bit kind of subconscious going on maybe we're seeking some comfort or feeling a little bit stressed or overwhelmed or perhaps we're wanting to use food to celebrate and share joy either way emotional eating can clue us into some emotional states or even some unmet needs like even the unmet needs of our core human needs which there's so many the key here is awareness by being mindful and exploring our eating patterns, we can learn a lot about ourselves. It's an opportunity to kind of take a pause and just think, what am I really feeling? What do I need right now? Sometimes that answer might be comfort of food and that's okay. Other times it might be a different approach of support or self-care and that's also okay, that's great. That does not mean that we should only handle our emotions with food, that is not the case. It's having a balance and recognizing what those needs are and how we can have healthy coping strategies that are are beneficial helpful that don't harm us and so if there's a point if emotional eating is doing more harm than good then in that case it's not really fitting into body kindness it's not really fitting into something we would want to continue and so it's really just that individual basis of how that emotional eating is really being implemented and just the awareness around it bringing yourself to that situation emotional eating can become problematic if that is like the only coping mechanism or if it leads to distress and just overall negative negative impact on oneself. Consistently using food as an emotional kind of way to cope with emotions, probably not ideal, but occasionally turn into comfort food when you're feeling down or wanting to celebrate. That isn't inherently like an unhealthy thing. Rather than labeling the entirety of emotional eating as like a bad thing, it's more beneficial, more helpful to understand why that is happening. And then also developing a range of strategies to use during those times, which if you need help for that, and mental health professionals can really help with the implementation of that. So this holiday season, let's just reframe the idea of emotional eating being bad, recognize that it's a very much normal part of the human experience, and we can focus on developing a really compassionate approach for those emotions rather than like guilt or shame around emotional eating. All right, so now let's move into myth number three, the final myth for this video, and that is the idea that you have to count your macros for fitness in order to like keep your 
fitness in the holiday season. Now, this myth stems from the idea that you have to count macros in order to be physically healthy. That one must like meticulously count their protein and their carbohydrates and their fats. And sometimes, I don't know if it's just like the space that I'm in, sometimes people, especially athletes, can feel like they really need to dial it in and focus in on that in the holiday season so that they don't like lose their health or lose their fitness. Now, overall, understanding the macronutrient breakdown, it can be helpful. It's not the end all be all of nutrition. Not everybody needs to count their macros or learn how to count their macros. I would not recommend it for the vast majority of people. For many people, they find that when they are really focused on those, that can take the joy, a lot of the joy out of eating and just having a healthy relationship with food, learning how to approach food with curiosity, compassion, and context, and really listening and recognizing those more subtle hunger and fullness cues and just overall what their body is needing. It can kind of cloud those out a little bit. Having a rigid approach of needing to meet your macro goals is not necessary for physical health. Our bodies sometimes have more energy expenditure or less energy expenditure on some days versus other days. Like sometimes our bodies need more or less food. Now with sports nutrition, I do work with a lot of athletes and some people really do appreciate or want to have a more macro focused approach. And I just really encourage people to recognize how that fits into their lifestyle and how much time and energy that they want to put into their food and to their health because it's certainly not necessary and can sometimes take a little bit longer. It takes a little bit more mental energy for planning and preparation and just calculating. Now, this might be a little bit of a hot take, but I have worked with a lot of high level athletes and we have found that you don't need to count macros in order to improve your performance. Now, some athletes do really like to have that approach and that focus. It is not up to me to tell people what like they can and can't do. Like part of me being a registered dietitian, especially one who focuses on the coaching aspect side of things, like it is not up to me to tell them that they should do this or they shouldn't do this. It's more of that guidance. And it really just depends on the person. Sometimes people might find that they want to track their protein intake just to make sure that they're meeting that because they typically find themselves under consuming that. And so that might be their approach rather than the other kind of macronutrients. It can really just, it can look different for a lot of people. But I will say that counting macros is not necessary for the improvement of health. Or sometimes if someone has like diabetes, they might need to count their carbohydrates if they're taking insulin, and especially when they're starting out and they're just kind of figuring out the carbohydrate grams to the insulin units that they're using. So like they're always, again, I don't really like dichotomous things and all or nothing kind of thing, but I will say that I've worked with many, many people and we can see an improvement in performance without needing to count macros. Moving away from something like macro counting can be a little bit challenging. There's a lot of skills within building and supporting a healthy relationship with food. And so it's not something that I ever expect someone to completely shift off of macro counting. That's not realistic. That's not really kind to expect that of someone in my opinion. So the myth of counting macros during the holidays to like keep your fitness, not necessary, but the implementation of somebody is used to that approach, the implementation without that, there are skills around that and that can be kind of scary to step away from. Which side note is one of the reasons why I created the Unlock Nutrition and Food Freedom community. It's basically just a project where I am focused focused on helping people with the implementation, moving away from traditional toxic dieting behaviors and really being able to approach food with that curiosity, compassion, and context and building and strengthening a healthy relationship with food. More information is in the description box if you're interested. All right, so in summary of this video, I hope you feel a little bit more informed, a little bit more hopefully empowered in your approaches around food. I'd love to hear from you. Are there other myths that you hear constantly or consistently around Around this time of the year or other times of the year feel free to share your thoughts in the comments if you have not already please leave a like on this video and make sure you're subscribed if you would like I would greatly appreciate that there are so many more myths to talk about to unpack so if you have any questions feel free to leave those down below and remember you can strive for health without subscribing to diet culture I'll see you later bye